tonight uh, is our third international uh, talk, international live stream. Uh, the two previews were absolutely fantastic, and I believe that tonight will be a very fantastic lecture as well. Uh, I know Dr. Peter has many friends in South America. He's very, very, very welcome, and thank you very much uh, for accepting our invitation. Uh, our moderator for tonight will be Dr. Fernando Otto. Fernando Otto is, is, uh, uh, is sponsored by uh, our, our Department of Sleep Medicine in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, Dr. Tatiana Vidigal, Tatiana Vidigal is another member, Dr. Edilson Zancanella, and Dr. Metinho Nersi from Ankara, Turkey, joined us uh, tonight. Dr. Nersi is a, a gen permanent general secretary of International Health Society. It's very important for us to have you here with us, uh, Professor Nersi. So uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, to the Brazilian Society of ENT for support us, uh, the Brazilian Academy of Rhinology, and, uh, and our hospital, Professor Edmundo Vasconcelos, for supporting this meeting. I'd like to thank you, Camila Dancy, uh, that's, that's our coordinator for all this series of uh, uh, live stream. So, uh, no more to talk. Thank you to everybody. And just to give the lecture to, I mean, sorry, to give it to, to words to Fernando, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Doraldo. Once again, I would like to uh, welcome everyone. I encourage you to send some questions after the Peter's presentation. We are opening uh, for discussion, and I'm trying to answer as many questions as we, we could. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Batista, especially, and Dr. Uh, Oners, especially for the time. It's very late in the night, and they are uh, very helpful with us. Uh, Dr. Batista, uh, screen is yours now. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to I'm going to share my screen a moment in my presentation, first of all. Just a second. Um, okay. Do you see, I think you see my presentation. Did you see it? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, you can. perfect. No problem. Okay, perfect. Well, first of all, I want to thank you very, very much um, for inviting me. I feel extremely honored, but I, I feel that I don't belong here because when I saw the names of those who are giving the conferences, um, I said, well, I don't belong there um, I, I, because they're the most impressive experts in rhinology um, worldwide known. And definitely, I, I I was shocked that I that um, that I had this invitation because I'm sure that um, same in Brazil and other there are other people worldwide that definitely I'm sure they are much better than me. But thank you very much though for 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 it, and of course um, for Edison who's a good friend and Fernando and and Dr. Um, not go there also. Well, so to, to start, the uh, first thing um, I would like to start off with is a presentation uh, uh, telling you where I live. I live, I'm originally from Venezuela, from Caracas, Venezuela, but I live in Pamplona, which is in the northern part of Spain. And Pamplona is known for the running of the bulls, which happens every single year. Not this year, though. Um, between the 6th and the 14th of July. So that, that should have been happening. This should happen next month. And unfortunately, it's not. But also, um, we have a big university. It's a Catholic university there. Um, and uh, I work in the hospital there. So you're all welcome, but probably next year, not this year, for um, the, the festivity of the running of the bulls in San Fermin in Pamplona. So... Um, to keep going on with the lecture today, what I would like to say is, first of all, um, to speak about sleep apnea in um, surgery in a short while is practically impossible, but I would like to point out certain things. And first of all, um, it's an upper airway um, problem, definitely. And the other, what 
we have, it's a very important impact in our quality of life, also cardiovascular, also endocrinological, and also um, neurocognitive, and, and has an impact also in mortality. And of course, an econ a great economic impact also. Um, every patient, though, is completely different. And structures are not the same. There, is a, there are differences in every single part in that upper airway between each patient. And we have to know that especially that we as human beings are completely different to other animals. And the reason why is because we have a long airway that goes from the nose up to the lungs. And this has been shown as the Starling Law. And we know that um, their upper airway has a tendency for collapsibility, especially when the nose is blocked. And that pressure, which is the, uh, a certain pressure that allows the airway to block, especially during the evening, is called a passive pharyngeal closing pressure, which is called picrid. Now, there are different types of collapse, uh, of sites of collapsibility, and also there are different types of of ways that it could collapse. It could go from mild collapse to a complete collapse of the airway. And of course, the, it just depends on the pressure that's placed in the outer structures against that airway that's gonna fall in or, or um, has the tendency to have it. And that depends many of times in different factors. And one of the factors, main factors, as ENTs that we always look at, of course, the differences in soft tissues, also in bone tissue, and also the relation that, is, that exists between both of them. When we see, um, of course, the upper airway is enclosed usually inside a bony cavity, and this structure is completely different between people. We might have normal structure with a normal um, soft tissue and a normal bony enclosure. And that way we have a normal airway in size. But unfortunately, sometimes we might have the soft tissues maybe enlarged and a normal airway of a bony enclosure, or we might have a normal soft tissues, but in a small um, bony structure, therefore, patients are completely different. We know also that if we block the nose of a child from a certain moment, there, is, there are gonna be changes in the face. And those changes in the face are gonna be seen especially in the maxilla, where we're gonna have a protrusion of the maxilla and a protrusion, we're gonna have a long jaw. And also those structures could be seen, those changes could be seen in the bite of the mouth, where we're gonna have uh, um, overprojection or um, of the teeth. Also, we're gonna have a high heart palate and also open lips and the posture of the patient is gonna be completely different. This could be seen also um, in changes in the nose where the nose is gonna be extremely um, um, narrow and as there are different um, um, studies that show this, where we see and hear what's blue is what exactly changes because there is a blockage of the nose and there is a, a change in the airway. This is not going to have only an influence in the nose, but also in the different structures that are inside the mandible or inside the mouth. And those changes are not going to be only in the bone, but also in the position of the soft tissues, especially the tongue, because there's, a, there's not gonna be a coupling with the heart palate, but also we could see in different studies, there is gonna be a change in the airway where a patient that has um, remains with an open airway has completely a, a tongue that falls backward and a patient who has mouth closed remains with an open airway. But also there are different types of obstructions that um, could be seen in every part of the airway. And we know that, but also fat is a principal factor that is extremely important, the distribution of fat. 
because fat does not only distribute in the abdomen or in the chest or in the buttocks, but also in the upper airway. And there are different studies that show this, that where the fat could distribute also in the palate and also there's an infiltration in the tongue. These are two patients that have the same, practically the same BMI. One has sleep apnea and one doesn't suffer from sleep apnea. And that's because of the distribution of fat. Also, we know that this is an upper airway um, um, problem and every single area of that upper airway where the ENT manages may have obstruction. There are different classifications that have been seen. There's the Fujita classification. Recently in, um, in the last probably 15 years, there are, there's a Friedman classification that has been set up and this is probably what we use more. And that classification is um, related to the uh, modified myelin patty, modified myelin patty. Um, it's, it's just because the mouth is inside, the tongue is inside the mouth and also related to the size of the tonsils. And of course, there's a classification of the tongue base also, which is very important. And we'll see that after. Now, each patient is completely different. Each patient um, is gonna have different features in symptoms and consequences of the disease. Also in the sleep studies, images are gonna be completely different. There are going to be differences according to age, also according to gender, also according to sleep position, and of course, in molecular profiles of each patient. Therefore, patients are completely different. So anatomy is important, it's true, but also we might see also other features in each patient where there's a low respiratory arousal threshold that tends to waken the person in a very, very easy way. Also, we might have completely different ventilatory response, or what we call a ventilatory instability that's related to the PAC2 um, of the patient. And also, we might have a hypotonic um, feature in the muscle, where the muscle is not as responsive as, as it should be. Therefore, people are completely, might have uh, one of those features or many of those features are combined completely. So when we see the sleep studies that we perform, those sleep studies are not perfect. When we classify a patient, unfortunately, we classify them according to the number of events. But um, the number of events does not relate completely according to what the patient is having many of times. We cannot um, classify and make each patient be the same according to what we know at this moment, because there are many other factors that are, we should take into account. One of those, of course, um, if we look at our, our sleep exams and we correlate it, of course, with also with our exam, with our, our studies, we might find different features also in the different curves or in, in and the different parameters of, ins of inspiration, expiration in each one of them. So therefore, this is uh, something that we should look at. Also, we have to look at the duration of at each respiratory event. And it seems that that it changes according to each patient. And there's a family trait related to this. Also, we know that patients sleep have have different parameters also according to the stage of sleep. We might have patients that have only sleep apnea and REM sleep, or, or some might have in any phase of sleep. Also, we might have patients that have only sleep apnea related, of course, to their position. When they're um, in the cubitus supine position, they might have sleep apnea. And when they turn over, they might not. Also, I just want to make um, patient symptoms are completely different. And this is a study that, was, that shows this. And of course, this study has been, um, I would say, has they're, they're, they're added more, more 
features to it, but we might say in an easy way that they might be patients who um, present sleep apnea and they don't sleep at night. They have insomnia. Others are completely asymptomatic but have comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. That's their way they show their, their sleep apnea. And of course, there are patients who have, are extremely sleepy during the night or during the day, I'm sorry. And those patients are the ones that we suspect most of the time. But I have to relate it. I have to tell you this. And genetics plays an extremely important role. We know patients that their parents have sleep apnea, most likely they're gonna have sleep apnea too. And they're gonna have certain features and respiratory control also in craniofacial morphology and also in their rhythm of sleep. So the first thing I wanna say is that obstructive sleep apnea is a complex disease. And therefore, the first take home message is that anatomy is important, but it's not everything. There are many, many features that are there. So the first thing that I wanna say to the normal, to the ENTs in general that don't manage sleep apnea is that not looking, not thinking that we're gonna be able to solve a problem exclusively by operating because we see big tonsils or because we see a long uvula or something like that. So that's number one. Number two, treatment for obstructive sleep apnea is completely, it's, 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 there's a wide range. We know that there, there are changes in um, habits, eating habits is something that's very, very good. Losing weight is fantastic. Using um, CPAP also, there are possibility of, of, of uh, mandibular advancement devices or different types of operations. Of course, choosing the right treatment is the key for success. That definitely is something important. We know that CPAP is the first line of treatment, I would say, in most patients. Sleep app is, has a high, it's very high in efficacy. Um, of course, it reduces frequency of respiratory events. It decreases the daytime sleepiness. It improves um, systemic blood pressure. It lowers the risk of crashes. It improves quality of life. But however, there is no convincing effect on mortality up to now at this moment. And of course, there is difficulty in a certain degree of patients um, because of adherence. Adherence is some, it's a problem at, and for most patients. Therefore, I would say that definitely one thing that we should know, and this is another take home message, is that CPAP is an excellent treatment for a high number of patients, but not for all. Therefore, we have to look for certain parameters. And we know, though, that probably choosing or giving the opportunity to a patient to not to operate first, but to give them the opportunity to try a CPAP is something very, very good and very, very useful. Third thing I would like to say is that definitely um, upper airway assessment is completely different if we do it awake with the patient sitting than if we do it asleep, the patient laying down and asleep. Therefore, um, one thing that's very, very useful is the use of drug induced sleep endoscopy. And this is something that in the past years um, we started doing and each day, each time we do more and more and more. And we have learned that um, to define different types of collapse. Those collapse, uh, those areas collapse were usually not only at the nose, but then rhinopharynx also, but also at the vellum. We could see different patterns of collapse, completely different patterns in each patient. Those patterns could go from no collapse to consent, complete concentric collapse. There are changes also at the level of the oropharynx and those changes at the level of the oropharynx um, are associated many of times with tonsils or with the lateral walls. And also we might see changes also at the tongue base um, where we might see a tongue that falls back completely or partially also changes at the level of the epiglottis where we see different patterns of changes, especially when the patient is asleep. Those, patient, those are patterns of obstruction where we could see that the, how the epiglottis plays a fundamental role many of times in the obstruction, especially in patients 
who do not tolerate CPAP. Many of times we could even check to see in those patients where are, that are using mandibular advancement devices, how their changes are, how a mandibular advancement device improves a patient. This is the same patient using a mandibular device, advancement device, and one that's not using. We definitely could see that um, this patient improves with the use because the airway is still open. So this also, we could actually know and we could use the dyes to know exactly what's happening to those patients who do not tolerate the CPAP or don't improve enough with the CPAP. And you could see how in this patient, um, we're doing it with the CPAP, we're doing an endoscopic um, examination and you could see what's happening. With the air pressure, the epiglottis is falling backwards and it's being pressured against the back wall. Therefore, it's, it's important. So my take home message number three is DICE provides useful information. Information that we're not gonna be able to gain with a patient while, uh, while awake. So it comes to the point where we say, well, when should we perform surgery? Uh, well, I think we should perform surgery, especially to improve CPAP tolerance, to transform the upper airway, and also in many occasions as a definite cure. Many of the different published papers out, out there are usually or have been up to a certain time ago, level three, level four, level five. And unfortunately, I would say that most of the time, um, that's why other specialties like pulmonologists, neurologists have not taken us into account. But fortunately, more and more papers are coming out where they show a high level, level two, level one, and even though it's surgery. So I'll start off with this, and I would say that I'll go by levels. First level, nasal surgery. Nasal surgery definitely improves, the, first of all, the use of CPAP definitely improves the patient. So uh, are you hearing me? Sorry. Could you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yes, we can. So, we can. Um, yeah. So definitely CPAP use, um, I mean, steroid nasal surgery is going to improve um, patients using the CPAP from 38.7, almost 40% to 90%. And there, there are randomized studies that show that there, there are they're definitely important. Also, they're, we're, they're gonna produce a reduction in the pressure of the CPAP, and also we're gonna improve the usage every single night um, by at least two, hour, two or three hours, which is extremely important. But also nasal surgery does not only improve the use of CPAP, but also improves quality of life. And that is extremely important. So we could make a difference in those patients who have sleep apnea. But unfortunately, we cannot say that, it, if the, that the effect of nasal surgery on the AHI is gonna be fantastic. So that is something that we should know. So the fourth take home message is that nasal surgery definitely improves CPAP compliance and adherence. Therefore, the nose is extremely important. It's pivotal for sleep Apnea. If we have a nasal blockage, we are um, not going to be able to improve a uh, patient um, at all. So I, I think that's something. But unfortunately, nasal surgery by itself is not going to improve the AHI of the patient. It's going to improve it, but very little. So let's go a bit further down. When we think, we think or when we talk about the oropharynx surgery, we, have, we know that uvulopalatal pharyngoplasty has been there for a long time. And definitely, um, unfortunately, um, I would say, um, there are different types of, or fortunately, there are different types of procedures at this moment. Procedures that tend to open up the airway and not close the airway as before. We know that Friedman stage, okay, staging system um, offers that and says that if a patient is Friedman stage number um, type one, definitely, which that means that he has a mal and patty, um, one or, or type one or type two with grade three or four tonsils, that patient, if he's, he's operated or she is operated of a urobulopar, a classic 
uvula pyrotrichoplasty is going to improve up to 80.6%, but the rest are, gonna, are not going to improve so much, unfortunately. Usually, um, and until a few years ago, until I'd say your colleague, uh, Michelle Cahali in 2004, um, really changed completely the mind of, of the ENT. Um, and that was thanks to, to him because he started um, doing something completely different. And what we used to do before, we used to do classical UP3. And that classical UP3, there were slight modifications, but usually those modifications of final outcome was variable, completely depending on scarring and how um, probably the patient was. Scarring was completely different according to each patient. And this is something that we all did. And this is something that we all saw after and we were practically praying for the patient to go well. And if scarring was very hard, we'll have problems. Therefore, there was a change in the way we look at things and the way we see things. And I want to mention this um, because there was a change in looking from behind and not looking from the front exclusively. This is Prince William. Prince William, wow, he's, it seems that he's doing something obscene. But if we look at him from a different angle, we're gonna see definitely that he is with a different type. He's, he's, his, his pose is completely different. That's the same way. We have to look from behind. We have to actually see what's happening with the muscles. And there's an extremely important muscle, which is the palatopharyngeal muscle that we have to look at. We have to see how this, if this muscle is actually closing in the airway. And this is what I would say, um, uh, Michel Cahali changed completely the way we were doing things. And um, he was actually scorned for it, but at, at the first moment, but definitely recognized. And um, he's definitely a, a great friend. So he created the, the path to different types of surgery. And this surgery could go from an expansion pharyngoplasty from Kenny Pang to a lateral pharyngoplasty with a great opening to at this moment where we're using barb expansion pharyngoplasty, which is uh, your use of the suture with certain concepts which are gonna improve the outcomes. Now we know that uh, Uvulopalaphryngoplasty is something that definitely um, is going to, it's, it's important because the palate, the obstruction of the airway, uh, the area of the palate and the oropharynx is important. This is a study that we performed where we saw that definitely there was an improvement. Doesn't matter the technique, but there was a better improvement in those that are new, newer techniques. So the fifth take home message I would like to say. Palate surgery is not classic UP3 anymore. It is not cutting the uvula either. It's, it's to remodel the area, it's to open up the airway. So definitely that's extremely important. We go a bit lower. We have tongue-based surgery. Tongue-based surgery is extremely important, especially in those cases where we see a very large tonsil, lingual tonsil, lingual tonsil that obstructs. There are different types of obstruction in the airway. And definitely um, surgery um, in this type of patient is completely mandatory and offers. Um, and it could be done by different techniques. Could be done with techniques with coblation-like, um, sorry, um, coblation, um, where we could see we're reducing the area um, of the lingual tonsil, we could do it with robotic surgery, we could do it with other types of surgery, but definitely the outcome. This is robotic surgery, this is a glossectomy um, that, that, that is easily done. Um, there, you have excellent doctors there in Brazil that do this, um, but you need uh, probably a robot, if not the coplator is an excellent tool. Um, and this has been shown worldwide, um, definitely. But definitely, I would say the six take home message that I would like to say is that tongue surgery is useful, especially as part of some multi level. If, if we do also the palate, also um, the nose at the same time or in, uh, in another moment, that is extremely useful. 
Now, also another thing that's important um, is epiglottis. Epiglottis has its um, surgery on the epiglottis. Uh, it's true, it's controversial, but I would say that in certain cases where we see a, a collapse, doesn't matter with the technique that we do it. I could do it with a, a robot, we could do it with a collator, we could do it with, a, with a, uh, the monopolar, doesn't matter what the outcome is what matters. And definitely um, we could see how patients who have a collapse before and after improve dramatically. So therefore I would say that doing an uh, epiglottectomy might change the game, might change completely um, the way um, a patient feels and how it improves. Now, if, when we talk about the tongue, we might have patients who have definitely poor, uh, poor muscle tone. And that's, this I said at the beginning. And this poor muscle tone is that because the tongue tends to fall back completely, um, especially when the patient is asleep. When, therefore, um, there are different types of surgery that have been done. I would say um, genioglossus advancement. There are, there's, there's a fixation also of the tongue against the bone. But unfortunately, that type of surgery does not work, especially because the tongue will keep on, still keep on falling back. And hypoglossus nerve stimulation has changed that, those parameters completely. Um, hypoglossus nerve, nerve stimulation um, produces, uh, it's a stimulus over the, the, the nerve, which is gonna um, open the airway, but not open the airway only at the level of the tongue, but also at the level of the palate. And this, for, this, therefore, it's going to change completely. At this moment, there are three types of models. There is the Livanova, the Inspire, and the Nixoa. Livanova was, um, I mean, Intera was purchased by Livanova two years ago. Inspire is FDA approved, and it's the one that it has more, more, most experience. And recently, we have the Nixoa, um, which is extremely interesting also. I would say that there are differences between each one of them. Probably the major difference between um, these, the first one, which is, or which is the latest one, which is Nixoa and Inspire and Interra is that the, the battery is completely external. Um, it's placed outside the body while these two others, the battery is inside. The other difference is that Nixoa is bilateral. Um, has bilateral stimulus, therefore the tongue is, is gonna be um, moved forward bilaterally. Although if you, when we implant the Inspire, um, we might have patients that are, are, the opening is gonna be bilateral. The other important thing is also um, in the type of generation of the electrical stimulus. That probably could be uh, another talk, but uh, um, for time, I mean, for, for this time, I think that's important. Now, I have implanted uh, um, with Inspire. And of course, there's a, a timeline. And that timeline goes from an evaluation, uh, drugs to induce sleep endoscopy. We have, after that, we go to a surgical implantation and after an activation, one month after. And after that, at two months after the operation, we go to a controlled titration um, with a polysomnogram. Um, which is gonna, we're gonna adjust the parameters. This is um, the implantation of the electrode and uh, with the Inspire, there, it has three electrodes there um, and the implantation is performed in the terminal branches of the middle, of the middle branch of the hypoglossal nerve, which is, um, and um, I just wanna show you how the, there is an opening of the airway Right here, when we do the dice, we don't need to do a dice, but in this patient, we did the dice. And you could actually see each time the patient breathes in, there's an opening of the airway. Um, it's a complete opening. So therefore, this tongue that's falling back, um, it's, it's completely different. And it's gonna uh, improve, the patient is gonna improve dramatically. The, we know that um, the data out there not only shows that there is an improvement in the HI and the ODI, also in quality of life, but also in the upward sleepiness scale, but that improvement has been seen 
and maintained during years for the patients who have been implanted. And also those, and this is one study, this is another study, those studies show definitely that are, they're very similar, um, very, very similar results. In, and there a, a meta-analysis that I published recently that shows that definitely there's an improvement not only in, in AHI, but also in quality of life in these patients. So the take home message here definitely is that hypoglossal nerve stimulation is it's very, very good. Um, it's titratable, it's adjustable, um, it's safe, it's effective, and definitely um, the only problem that it's expensive. That's the only um, problem at all. The other point, if we go to maxillar mandibular, um, if we go to bone, to change bone, definitely there are different types of uh, procedures. Maxillar mandibular advancement is one of them. It, it tenses the muscles of that air, of the area of the airway um, as we move forward um, the the bone, um, but not it's not always perfect, of course. But I would say it definitely the the results are are very very good, very high. Of course, it changes the the face, okay, the the look of the patient. But um, I would say the 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 results are pretty good um, or excellent, I would say very, very good, but not in all patients. Lately, and this is something that there, um, I would say that's extremely important to know. Lately, as we know, as I spoke at the beginning, patients who, have, who are mouth breeders definitely have extremely high bold, have a, a very, very high palate. And Fortunately, in children, we could expand, but in adults, that's not possible. And recently, um, the group of Stanford have started um, trying to expand completely the area, doing a Lefort and also a medial cut over the, the, the maxilla. And therefore, this expands the, the nose completely, it expands few millimeters, especially in those, and this is those for the rhinologists who actually are always looking because there is a narrow nose, extremely narrow. Well, expanding with this technique might, might make a difference. And of course, it's to remodel the bony structures. That's what um, is important at this moment. Trochaostomy is still, unfortunately, something that's there. And, and there are certain patients who have craniofacial deformities or extreme obesity that definitely the, the, the area is gonna collapse and therefore tracheostomy is something that we have to maybe necessary, especially in severe cases. Um, the other point that I wanna um, sort out here is that definitely, as I said before, um, quality of the papers that are coming out have shown that there is an improvement um, in patients who are, operate, are operated for sleep apnea and functional quality of life and cardiovascular risk. Also patient papers that have shown um, there's an improvement of the mortality. There's, there, uh, there's a lowering of the motor vo vehicle accidents. Also there's, there have seen changes in the PSG and of course surgery, especially in those, pa those places where there's no money for CPAP and also where the electricity, there's no electricity, probably surgery is probably the best option for those patients. So definitely surgery shows an improvement in diverse parameters. And also uh, there are high quality scientific papers at this moment. The last message that I would like you to take home is definitely that multi-level surgery has definitely, and there, there are different papers that show this, better results. So it's not operating in one site only, but it's operating in multiple sites where we're going to have an improvement. Of course, I want to say these are, um, um, these are 12 key points that I've, I've um, pointed out here. These are not, um, uh, I would say these are not the 12 commandments at all. These are um, just key points that might have uh, uh, ENT that doesn't practice um, sleep surgery.
history all the time to understand and to have uh, a knowledge. Um, I would, the last, my last slide is this. Unfortunately, we're living in this pandemic. Um, my heart goes out. We've had over 40,000 deaths here in, in Spain. And um, although the government says it's 27, but we know that there are over 40. And unfortunately, it's happening all over the world at this moment. So our hearts go out to the patients that have been suffering, but also to all the doctors that are trying and, and we have to deal with this every single day. And thank you very much. And I'm open to any questions. Thank you, uh, Peter, for your, your great uh, presentation. Uh, I think you have showed us uh, an overview, uh, especially in what concerns the physiopathology and uh, the phenotypes that we are studying nowadays. And you went through every, every kind of surgery and this, this way to present the key points were, were very interesting. I'm going to open now for discussion uh, and I'm going to uh, ask Tatiana, ladies first, of course, uh, to make her comments and her questions and then we go on and, and answer some questions from the, the audience. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. Good evening, Professor Peter Batista. It's an honor for me to be here, and it's always a pleasure to learn from you. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Aldistan and Dr. Fernando Baliero for this opportunity, and Camila for the organization. Uh, Dr. Peter, I have a question for you about the DISE, Drug Induced Sleep Endoscopy. Um, I believe that DISE can be a helpful tool to show more information when our awake physical exam doesn't identify the obstruction site, especially for tongue-based level epiglottis. But I think the sleep endoscopy has some limitations. We, I think that we, we still need to standardize it, the technique, the classification systems, the finding, the interpretation of the findings, and the patterns of the collapses. Based on it, uh, I'd like to know how you incorporate DISE in your clinical routine, not in research, okay? I'd like to know, in your opinion, if uh, does DISE change your surgical plan? And uh, those, uh, all the collapses observed need to be treated considering that in most of the time uh, they are much level obstruction? No, um, I, first of all, well, thank you very much for the question. I mean, um, definitely um, DICE is not perfect, but, um, and I think that there's learning curve um, yeah. and those that, that there's, it's, there's a discrepancy between um, let's say a person who has not much experience and a person who has more experience. As we go on um, looking at dice and doing dice, we start learning and we know we start to, to uh, acquire um, knowledge, especially, and, and have a better understanding of what's happening. Um, it's true. It's, it's not perfect and it just depends how it's done. I would yeah. say, first of all, you have to take time. It's not a matter. It's not yeah. a matter of of just doing it and yeah. and pushing an endoscope in, and and that's it. That that's that's impossible. And you have to have the right anesthetist also, and um, you have to speak to the anesthetist to for him for him or for her to understand what what you're looking for, yeah. um, and maintain a certain level of sedation. That, that is extremely important. Then yes. the second thing um, is that we, we also have to, to know, I mean, it, it's true that we, we have a knowledge ahead of time of, which, of what's happening. But in my experience, and I do dies to, I would say most of the patients that I'm gonna operate on, has changed the way I look at things. I have been surprised sometimes thinking that this patient is going to, was going to have a tongue-based collapse. And what the patient had was a collapse at the level of the epiglottis 
or had a uh, collapse at the level of the of the larynx or had a collapse also at, or a level at the level of the palate. Yeah. So it, it, is, it has given me information or it provides information that, that I would have seen before. It's true, it's one more study. Now, it might be expensive in certain places. In my practice, we try to perform the dice, um, as I said, for those patients who are gonna be operated or okay. in those patients who were operated previously and failed. Failed. So, and failed. Yeah. Um, and that gives us uh, an important information. Um, therefore, it's not perfect. And I know that, that many of you um, do an excellent job without having to do DICE. Um, so I, I cannot say, look, DICE is wonderful. No, no. I, I would say that it just depends on what you have what you have available, that's what's gonna be best for you um, and to improve the patient. In my experience though, I would say that DICE is a very, very useful tool, especially to provide information or to confirm information that I've thought about that it's gonna change um, or it's gonna improve my surgery. Okay, and just one more question about it. Which do you think are the best findings related to good uh, surgical outcomes on the eyes, uh, tonsil collapses, partial um, collapse. I, I would say, I, I would say um, sometimes, look, um, you see patients that have at the oropharynx that have tonsils grade one. Yeah. I mean, grade one, and, and those tonsils, when you see them in the exam and in your, in your office, and you do the endoscopy on them, I mean, they're definitely, they, you, you won't believe that their, their oropharynx is gonna collapse. And suddenly you do see them um, collapse. They, they, they come together and they start obstructing. So I would say that is fantastic. That is number one for me. Number two for me will be the epiglottis. I mean, mm -hmm. looking at the epiglottis obstructing, especially those epiglottis who have, uh, that are like, and omega, okay, mm -hmm. and they close in, that is something marvelous. I mean, to yes. see, because the first time you, you're able to see it, um, you realize, wow, um, how, how I didn't think about this before. That's number, number two in my list. And number three in my list, I would say, is definitely um, the, the way the tongue base falls back in some patients. And that those patients, are the ones who I'd say that are candidates for a hypoglossal nerve stimulation. I mean, there is a, they're hypotonic. It's true though, that if you use propofol in some patients, you might have, I mean, and they're very, very deeply sedated. They might have hypotonic, there, there would be hypotonic. But if, if you're doing it the right way, if you, and, and, and you see that, you're gonna probably have great success um, by doing hypoglossal nerve stimulation. So I don't know if that answers your, your question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the, the audience uh, asked one question, which drug are currently being used for sedation and which is the anesthetic protocol that, that you use? Uh, do you know? Okay, um, I use, um, in my hospital, we use propofol. The reason why we use, I mean, this has been, been a discussion. Um, dextrometamidine is probably uh, uh, an excellent drug. The only thing that it takes, you take much longer. You need much more time with each patient. And unfortunately, um, we, don't, we don't have the time. And so we've been using propofol. Um, I've had good results with the propofol, I would say, but I, I, uh, I would like to use, to be able to use dextrometamidine. And a great friend of ours, um, Rodolfo, Lugo in Mexico um, uses it with um, great success. Um, but in my, in my, in our protocol, we'd use always propofol. And what we use it with an infusion pump. And that's extremely important to use it with an infusion pump always, not by bolus, but an infusion pump. And that infusion pump also, we connect also, and we do it with BIS, B-I-S, bispectral. Right, and that bispectral, the one I use is bilateral. 
not unilateral. So what I take um, as an important factor is not the number of the dice, okay? But I take the spectrum of, of, of sedation. Another, um, and the SPF, that is what, that is my data to know exactly, because sometimes when we do dice, we see a patient that is really asleep, really sedated, and he has a parameter and a normal um, vice that's about, I would say 70, and it's completely down. And at contrary, we might have a patient who is um, at 40 and is still moving. So okay. that, that, that is something that, that, that um, we, we know. I think there's, there's room for improvement though, and as, uh, as other doctors have put it, um, there are certain things that we have to we have to to improve, and and the improvement though has to be individual. I mean, it cannot and take tips and tricks from other from other people that have more experience because that that is basic. I mean, when we start off, we always do the same thing, and we um, um, and we when we learn something new and we put that into practice, then we start learning other other factors that might might improve our outcomes. So thank you. It, uh, Dr. Anersi, do you have any considerations, any questions? Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, Peter, it was a great lecture. Thank you very much. I thank enjoyed you. it very much. Thank you. But I would like to stress one very important thing. It's the you you like. I mean our colleagues they should think twice before touching the uvula. And they should only, if they need to remove it, only the tip of the uvula and leaving as much mucosa as possible in the posterior surface. Because I can talk on the functions of uvula for 15 or 20 minutes because it has such a functional organ. It's an organ and it's a very important organ. My question, Peter, to you. If the tosses are small, what is what is your preference for palatal surgery? What kind of palatal surgery do you perform? And secondly, my second question about palatal surgeries: If you remove the tosses, other types of surgeries added to tonsillectomy because expansion, pharyngoplasty surgery, etc. All these surgeries are done after tonsillectomy. What is the benefit of these surgeries? And then I will ask another question after sure. these comments. Um, when, I, when there's a, a small tonsil, definitely, I mean, as I said before, when we do the dye, sometimes small tonsils definitely um, are going to obstruct. And the, but the obstruction might be from the palatopharyngeal muscle. So, um, to, to get to palatopharyngeal muscle, most of the time we do have to get towards the, um, we have to take away the tonsil. So taking away the tonsil um, is, is something that, that is, is straightforward, but it's something that we, we, when we start going down to the palatopharyngeal muscle, there are different techniques that could be done. And those techniques vary according to what we have seen before and according also to the strength of that palatopharyngeal muscle. If that palatopharyngeal muscle, I mean, um, I'm going to put it this way. Um, Dr. Mario Mantovani from Italy um, has a technique which is called the Roman blind technique, the Alianza technique, really, who um, he does uh, surgery with Barb barb suture, and he he actually places the muscles laterally, going to the rafe terigo mandibular, um, and that that is extremely important. Now he does not cut the muscle ever. Okay, so I've had, um, of course, very very kind discussions with him, but I would say that when the muscle is extremely strong. Strong means very, very thick, and you you could do any any you could try to place place the muscles sideways, but unfortunately, it's not gonna it's not gonna stay there because the 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 force 
that is there. So we have to weaken the muscle. Weaken the muscle does not mean cutting the muscle completely. It means um, weakening it slightly, cutting it slightly in order to, to, to be able to, for, for the structures to stay laterally where you need them to stay. So that's, that's something that I would say it's important. Therefore, there, each technique, I, I, don't ever, I don't use the same technique all the time. I would say I would use a different technique according to what I have seen, what I've noted down, and according to what I see during the operation. Um, there are patients that come also um, as contrary that don't have, that are, have been operated from their tonsils already. And what they, and there's, they're, they're, that area still keep falling in. So performing uh, a type of surgery like a lateral pharyngoplasty, like an expansor pharyngoplasty or a barb suture um, um, placement or, or, or um, ex, uh, replacement um, is extremely important and it's gonna modify. So um, I, I'm comp I, I think it just depends on what we're seeing. Now we have different armamentum. We have different types of, of, um, of techniques. Doesn't mean that we're, the, the best technique is one. I think it, we have to choose the right technique for each patient. And I'm completely in accordance with you about the uvula. I, I, when I started off, and I mean, I used to cut off the uvula and the patients would come back to, to me saying that, you know, they have the, the body, uh, uh, a foreign body sensation all the time. And there were, there were my, they were completely saying this to me every single time they came back. And I had nothing to do because I could not offer them because I had cut off the uvula. And, and, and unfortunately, I mean, once you cut off the uvula, the only the tip, as you said, should be cut off. I mean, if we have a very long one, if we could cut mm -hmm. off the tip, doesn't mean, but conserving the uvula, it's important. And those for, for those ENTs that don't know about it, definitely, as you said before, um, first of all, it's, it's important um, to, to clean the back of the, of the throat. It's also, it has glands, salivary glands, which are extremely important. And also in certain yes. languages, it might be extremely important also. Um, so I, I think we have some, to, and it's there for some, for a reason. Of course, some other functions too. We can discuss it later about the function yes, and yes. very uh, important. And my second question is about the time base. The uh, hypoglossal nerve stimulation is getting more and more popular. And there are some reports are getting very good results. But the problem is, the results are not 100% successful. And according to share criteria, this does not mean complete cure. 50% reduction of the optimum hypertension index, etc. So many of these patients have some hypertrophy of lymphoid tissues in the time base. So in these patients, do you think it makes sense to perform coagulation or robotic surgery? By the way, we have a sleep uh, institute. I am the director of this institute. We have all kinds of equipment. We can do all kinds of surgeries. But we should think I mean, we need more reports because many reports are coming from industry-sponsored studies. We should see more results about the hypoglossomer uh, stimulation. And we perform a lot of robotic surgery and coagulation, smile surgery, let's say, in other words, to reduce the lymphoid hyperplasia. What is your comment on these uh, surgeries? Well, I, I, first of all, I mean, I, uh, as I, I also, I, I use the, the coblator, I use the, the robot, and I use the hyperbolic nerve stimulation. I think there's a room for each one. I mean, uh, first of all, I, I would say that um, if we have a lingual hyper, hyperplastic uh, lingual tonsil, definitely it's not gonna improve. 
with uh, hypoglossal nerve stimulation. We, we, we need to, to treat the, the, with robotic surgery or coplation. I mean, it doesn't matter the tool. What, what, what's important, I mean, is what you have at hand. That, that's the most important thing. That's, that's, a, that's an important message that I want. I, I, I cannot say that a tool is gonna make a difference in outcomes. I mean, it might mm. improve in some aspects, but um, if you don't have it, doesn't mean it, it, you're not gonna be able to do anything. Um, especially I, 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 in, in certain places, robotic surgery is extremely expensive and only if you have it in your hospital, it's worth it. Otherwise, it won't be worth it uh, per se. So um, as you said before, um, sometimes I've seen, and, and, and these are publications where there are a lot of people who are actually in, implanting um, patients um, with hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Um, it's true you have to fill certain criteria, but maybe um, you can improve previously certain parameters and, 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 and improve outcomes in a better way. I've had patients where I've operated of robotic surgery first, and then after I have implanted because they've gone from 40 something to 20 something. And then from there on, okay, they still had symptoms and therefore hypoglossal nerve stimulation with an open airway or with a better airway, yeah, it was an improvement. Um, when I discuss with some of those people, though, some of those surgeons, unfortunately, they say, well, well you know, I have good results. So I don't know, but I, I, in my, in the way I think about it, it we have to, to go first to what we know is going to improve. Like if we have, if I had large tonsils, would I implant uh, a hypoglossal nerve stimulation? No. I would take away the, the large tonsils first or do something else. Um, and then after, see if the patient is really going to need. So you're, you're, you're right in, 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 in that aspect. And it's true that sometimes they're sponsored. But I, I think that, that um, it just depends, I mean, in, in the way you think about things. And, and, but, but hypoglossal nerve stimulation is something that when, you try, when you've seen it, when you've done it, um, and you see the results, definitely there's a great improvement. And also what, what, what I like about it, it's completely adjustable. And I think that in some cases um, in the future, um, or we've seen now with the new hypoglossal nerve stimulation that's gonna be bilateral, there might be a place um, to improve certain outcomes and maybe, in, um, because we have to select very well, like the, one of the criteria is for INSPIRE, it's a concentrical collapse. Maybe, maybe, and um, in in future they're 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 working on it. Maybe there there be a place um, for not to exclude those patients with concentric, because the that you know the hypoglossal nerve stimulation, the bilateral stimulation is going to be very very effective. Let's see. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Edilson, do you have something? Yes. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I need to thank you, uh, Augustin, for this wonderful educational program. And uh, I need to thank you so much for the invitation and uh, to Fernando and uh, all, the, all the people in this, in this session. And uh, it's a great pleasure to stay with uh, Peter. Uh, Peter is a, is a very good friend. And uh, last year, uh, he was here in Brazil. And uh, our Congress was excellent because you are a wonderful lecturers. As we saw, this moment are very, very, very nice. And uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Peter, uh, I think the, the idea when talking about uh, choosing options for treating patients are very interesting because we need to know a lot of things. We know we need to know to see a PSG study. We need to understand how the outcomes could be better when treating. But we need to know about the physical examination and the very good points that you 
had shown. And uh, it's not so easy when we try to to show this to our residents and uh, because, oh, let's do some kind of surgery, let's do some, and uh, we try to show that everything is a, is a little huge for understanding. And after this, we need to try to tailor for the best patients, the best uh, surgical solution. And uh, uh, I totally agree with your explanation and sometimes the tools that we have for uh, performing the surgery are not the best options. And sometimes we need to change the idea because our different uh, uh, situations that we only can find when in the operating room. And the one, one question, and uh, it's from the, from the audience too, it's uh, how much is the, the hypoglossal nerve stimulation? The, the, how much it costs? Okay, um, I think it depends on where you're located. In Europe, um, where I am, it's uh, the hypoglossal nerve stimulation costs 22,000, only the device. The device you have to take um, in, you have to think that, of course, you're going to have to perform surgery, and at the same time, you're going to have to have a previous um, dice, and also you have an activation um, one month after, and a PSG also after. So, um, what we do is we're, we make a package, okay, and then in that package, um, it will come out to about probably 28,000. Um, euros. That, that's what it will cost. I mean, we try to lower it as much as possible, but of course these patients are paying out of their pockets. Um, that's, that's, that's a big difference. I mean, if it's insurance, um, it will be different, but unfortunately here in Spain, it's not covered yet. It's covered in different countries in Europe, like in Germany, in Holland, also in Belgium, it's covered. Um, and, and, and in Switzerland, I think it's covered also, but not, not, not in Spain for now. Okay. So um, that's, that's, that's approximately the cost. Okay. And, uh, I think we are very, when we saw something that technology is coming, we get very excited in, in doing that. And we saw something different. Oh, and the technology can improve something. I think it's a very good option in thinking about. But your experience in working with this tool is something like uh, it's it's something uh, new that can change it, a lot of things. Or do you think that we are learning more than with other um, uh, other measures, other uh, ideas, other kind of uh, discovering new things? to try to understand a little bit more and we probably will have more ev evolution on treating this apnea. Well, I think that your, your question is a very good question. I mean, we're all attracted. Everybody is attracted by something new. When we see a new car, we're attracted by it. When we see a new computer, we're attracted by it. When we see a new, new phone, everybody wants to have, I want to have iPhone 11, um, even though our phone, right, is it's good and we're still in the iPhone 7 or iPhone 6 or whatever, as long as it works, it's fine. So definitely, I, I have to put it this way. I mean, uh, we have to be practical and, and, and unfortunately, we have to live in a world where not everything is spending, not everything is money, and not everybody has the money. Um, and unfortunately, also the healthcare system does not have enough money for everything. Um, but when we start um, analyzing, and if we have the opportunity to, to use certain tools, we know that we might be able to improve outcomes in patients. Um, and hypoglossal nerve stimulation is something that definitely shows an improvement. Now, um, it's expensive, okay? It's very, very expensive at this moment, but maybe, and I think it's a possibility that in a certain, in, in a close future, as, and, and also with different companies outside there, probably there's a possibility of, of, of the new implant being lower in price, and therefore 
it, it's going to be something good um, for uh, patients. But there's one thing we have to understand. It's not only implanting. And this is something we have to know. It's not a matter of implanting because I, I think that every surgeon uh, out there, you're all excellent surgeons, probably better than me, okay? Um, but we need other things around it to implant. We need um, uh, to work as a team with other specialties in order to, to be able to manage um, the implantation. It's, a, it's You have to work as a team. It's not a matter of, of I implant and that's it. It's, it's not that. Remember, when we implant a patient, we're going to have a patient um, forever. We're going to put it that way. We're going to have a patient where we're going to have to follow up forever. And there are certain parameters that we don't know how, how to manage. Well, we need probably a neurologist. We need a, a probably in certain cases a psychiatrist. We might need a pulmonologist. Therefore, it's working with a team. If you work as a team, especially in sleep, and we know that in sleep apnea, uh, teamwork is makes a big, big difference. Therefore, I, I think that um, before thinking of, of just implanting, you have to have in mind that you have to work with a group of people who have the same interests that you have, but know more than you in certain things, okay? Because you could be an excellent surgeon and you're gonna be the best surgeon of the world, but you need somebody else to fix those parameters and that patient to adjust those parameters. And not like I work with a neurophysiologist or a group of neurophysiologists who know much more than I do in certain things. So that's, that's something that I, I have to think about. The same thing happens though with other, other, um, with other devices. Um, robotic surgery also. I mean, does everybody want to have a, ro a robot? No, it's not, it's not like that. It just, it, it's, not, it's impossible for everybody to have a robot. Uh, and therefore, um, new technology is very attractive, but it's not available. And, there are so many patients that we have to treat that we have to come down um, to ground, okay, to be ground zero and not to be in, in the space, in outer space. Um, it, it, it's very limited around, and therefore, I, when I think about this, um, I, and, I, and I, I, I must say why I think this way, because I've, as I said before at the beginning, I'm from Venezuela, okay? Um, and in Venezuela, okay, I, I was a surgeon there. I worked at an ENT, et cetera, et cetera. But I worked in very, very poor hospital. I mean, in a, in a university hospital where we didn't have availability of, of different things. And we just invented things. We just invented, and, and that's the way it is in, in Latin America. That's the way it is. And we'd love to have technology. When you have the technology, when you have the availability, then it's something completely different though. And I would say that, but you're doing a great job. I mean, all the people out there um, by yourself, just listening, just wanting to learn and everything because th that makes a big difference completely. I mean, you don't have to have the latest technology. You just have to have the want to do and help patients. That's the most important thing. Thank you so um, much. I totally agree. Yes, thank you. Uh, Peter, uh, I have a question. We are uh, almost uh, running out of time. We have more ten minutes. I want to like uh, to answer, uh, for me to answer a question, and then I'm going to uh, make some questions from from the audience. But my question is concerning the outcomes. Uh, we know, and a recent uh, paper has been published that uh, AHI is not the, the the best way to measure outcomes. Um, as you've shown, we have different phenotypes and we have a different physiopathologies. And uh, in your clinical practice, which, what do you think is the best way to measure your outcomes? Uh, how, how do you uh, feel that uh, your surgery or your, uh, any treatment you, 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 you give to the patient uh, has gone to a good outcome? Um, definitely. I mean, first of all, the shear criteria is not the best at all. I mean, the shear criteria is AHI, 
um, lowering the AHI a certain amount. Um, and the AHI is not the best parameter. It's something that has to be there and it's something that everybody um, talks about and we talk the same language that way. But definitely um, um, there are different outcomes that, that are, are needed. And one is of course, some, if, if the patient has comorbidities and is improving, like his, his blood pressure pill, um, he does not have to take a certain amount of his blood pressure pill. That's a good outcome. That's an excellent outcome, I would say. Um, if the patient is less, has less somnolence, um, that's an excellent outcome. If he feels better, that's an excellent outcome also. So, I mean, there are many, many, many factors that you have to have to take into account. Unfortunately, though, unfortunately, the one that everybody speaks about at this moment is AHI. Um, and that's what we, we tend to speak about. But I, we have to explain to our patients that that's not the only parameter. Patients are much more satisfied because they don't know anything about AHI absolutely anything. They know about what they feel. They know exactly that if they feel well, then they're much better off. That's what they know about. And the same way with us. I mean, that's our satisfaction. I mean, when we might see a patient that has an AHI of 80 and we will lower it to 40. And unfortunately, we didn't beat this, the shared criteria, but that patient improved by surgery. That's, that's a that's a good outcome. That doesn't mean that's a bad outcome. We're improving things. We're improving probably his death, his, his possibility, his mortality. We're probably improving. And that has been shown that Ed Weaver showed that years ago, definitely. But, um, but as I said, once again, um, it's not the best. Uh, Kenny Pang um, has what you call sleep goal. And he has, he is wanting us to, to actually, um, to, to do a, a paper and an investigation with him. Um, sleep goal has its different acronym for different types of parameters, which is, I think it's extremely interesting, extremely good, and might be um, something even better. But uh, we still don't know. I mean, there are probably other outcomes out there. There are probably other parameters, even in the that PST that we don't know. We just don't know. Just probably improving the amount of time that the patient is in apnea is probably probably an even better outcome but the number of AHIs. So I think that's 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 something that we have to see. Uh, we, we have one question from the audience uh, to tell us about your experience with the barbed suture. Yes. Um, well, I like barb suture. I, uh, from the first moment I tried it, I said, wow, this is fantastic. And I, and I um, started using barb suture. I have not stopped using barb suture. I think it's, it's, it's really important. What, what's important though, is to actually where to start and where to finish. I mean, where, where you're gonna anchor um, your stitches is what's important, more important than anything else. Um, so you have to anchor it at the junction between the palate, the hard palate and the soft palate, and also in the raffi. Um, that's where you really have to anchor your sutures. If not, you're really not going to be, the, the sutures are probably going to tend to move. But if you anchor them the right way, and um, I'd say barb suture is uh, also a change. It's one more tool, um, not, not expensive, and therefore I think everybody could use it. Uh, does anyone have anything else? Tatiana, Edilson, Dr. Donercy, any questions? No, it was a great lecture indeed. Uh, the lecture covered many topics, but this is a huge topic and there are so many things to discuss, but there are so many aspects. For example, tongue-based surgery. Each surgery has its merits. So you can use different surgeries. As Peter uh, said, there is not surgical techniques only. There is patient and you should, you should adjust the surgery to the patient. So thank you, Peter. Excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, there's one more comment, I think, offer. Uh, Peter, uh, yes. now we are discussing a lot for returning 
performing surgeries and here in Brazil now we are waiting for some some news yet but now I think that you are uh, returning to the operating room what's the, what's the new protocol for performing surgery on your service okay um, so each patient um, that um, it's going to be operated on it has um, we have, we perform PCR on it on him and all on her and also we perform a chest CT scan um, uh, as a protocol. That's the day before. The other thing that um, we've been using, of course, is an FP3 mask. Um, and also um, we'd use, of course, um, goggles. Um, we, I use an aspirator at this moment, which is uh, uh, an aspirator that especially has a filter a special filter, it's a buffalo aspirator. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's very, very interesting. Of course, um, there are different brands outside there, but this is a very interesting aspirator um, that has uh, a filter and you could place it right over when I, I'm operating in the nose or in the mouth, I could actually place it. It's not the normal aspiration system that you have of um, that that goes in, 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 the, in your, and your tube or whatever. No, this is a special aspirator that it's very strong, it's good, it's, 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 and, and it's effective, definitely. You could see how, how all the plume um, comes out completely. So I, I would say, I would suggest that that's, that's something important, especially for us as ENTs that we operate in the mouth and the nose. I think that definitely that, we'll, that, that can make a uh, change in the way we, we perform um, our surgeries, and we probably didn't notice it before. Okay, thank you. Uh, just Dr. Just Peter, uh, do you perform palatal procedures for simple snoring or in mild apnea, like radio frequency or other devices, coblation? Yes, 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 yes. We do perform um, um, simple for simple for snoring. Um, we do perform. Yeah. yeah. And do, uh, what are your results about it? <laughs> well, I think it just depends. I mean, um, there are different types of, of procedures that could be done. I mean, I don't think you have, you need uh, uh, to make a large procedure to, in order to improve the snoring. And usually just doing the nose usually um, might yeah. improve the snoring. So it, it's a possibility. It just depends. You have to check the patient right out adequately. Thank I don't you. know well, if... Well, uh, uh, it's very late, uh, and, and I would like to, to thank you, Peter, for, for your great presentation and for this amazing discussion. Uh, I would like to thank you very much, Tatiana, Edilson, and also Dr. Onersi. Now you can rest. Thank you very much. And I'm thank going you. to call uh, Dr. Aldo for closing the session. And just uh, reminding you that uh, next Tuesday we're gonna have uh, another round of cough talks with otology. Dr. Aldo, are you there? Camila, do you want to to say something? If you if you if you, if you, if you put my face, I, I appreciate. Let me see. I'm trying to do it. Oh, you but are I trying. Can. Let me let me see. Oh yeah. So here, wow. it's me. It's me. <laughs> Everyone is, is listening oh. to you. I uh, we have some some questions from the audience, uh, but I think it's uh, is impossible to answer all questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. As you know, uh, uh, sleep, sleep medicine is not my field, but I must confess you that for the first time in my life, I I understand not hundred percent but almost 100% of all your explanations, especially the different techniques you use, uh, the new technology, etc. So um, it's really amazing. I'd like to thank, thank you. you so much thank for you. this fantastic lecture. I'd like to thank you to all the, the panelists, especially our, our international guests from, from Turkey. It's very late now in Turkey. It's almost one o'clock in the morning. And for all the participants, and our moderator, uh, Dr. Uh, Fernando, it was great, Camila. And just like to, to announce here the, uh, our next uh, lecture, uh, 
that will be next Tuesday, I'm sorry, 6 p.m. It's a lecture about uh, otology, about ear surgery with Professor uh, Robert Vincent from Bézier, France. All of you are more than guests to come to assist this, this new lecture. Thank you very much for everybody. And Thank I you. hope you enjoy like I'm, I enjoy it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good Thank night, you. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Peter. Bye-bye. 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 Ready to?